Ever since Hideo Nomo crossed the Pacific, Japanese players have flooded into Major League Baseball and rewritten the very fabric of the sports landscape. From Seiya Suzuki to Kodai Senga to Shohei Otani, some of the very best players in MLB right now started their careers in Nippon Professional Baseball. In this offseason, there's a whole new crop of stars leaving Japan to receive huge paydays. So let's talk about every MPB player making the jump to MLB next year, including Shota Imanaga, Yuki Matsui, Naoyuki Uesawa, Yorio Rodriguez, and of course, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. DNA Bay star Southpaw Shota Imanaga may not look especially imposing on the mound, but he has world-class stuff, winning the Central League strikeout title this past season with 174 punchouts in 148 innings. His 29.2% strikeout rate was 2.5% better than the next best pitcher, and almost 10% better than league average. He does it with a deep 6-pitch mix consisting of a 4-seam and 2-seam fastball that sits 91 to 93 miles per hour, a changeup and slider in the low 80s, a curveball in the low 70s, and a cutter that has never been a good pitch for him, so he should probably phase out completely. The changeup and slider are both excellent weapons in terms of generating width, but he threw the fastball more than any qualified pitcher in MPB this season, and for good reason. It has fantastic rise with over 20 inches of induced vertical break, giving him a 149 stuff plus rating on the pitch during the World Baseball Classic, according to Eno Siris. Given that Imanaga is only 5'10 and gets down pretty low for his delivery, it really gives his fastball the illusion of significant rise from that release point. Now, Japanese pitching philosophy stresses keeping the ball down in the zone, and that's where Imanaga collects the majority of his strikeouts, but he's not that great at keeping the ball on the ground, as his 55.8% fly ball rate was by far the highest in MPB this season. That also means he's prone to getting barreled up every once in a while and taken deep, as he gave up the second most homers in MPB this season, and the 8% home run to fly ball ratio isn't great relative to the dead ball environment. But opposing hitters chased outside the zone 35% of the time against him this past year, and if he's able to adapt to the MLB meta to get more comfortable climbing the ladder, then sluggers with big uppercut swings should struggle against his elite fastball, which also sets them up to be put away with his changeup slider combo. And it's absolutely reasonable to expect him to make that sort of transition because he has superb control, walking under 6% of batters faced in each of his last three campaigns. Imanaga is also in the prime years of his career right now, as his 2.38 xFIP in 2023 was by far the best mark in his career, and he's increased his average fastball velo every season, all the way from when he was barely averaging 87 miles per hour in his rookie year, up to the low to mid 90s he's at now. Entering his age 30 season, MLB Trade Rumors projects Imanaga will get a 5 year deal worth $85 million, more than Kodai Senga got last off season, which is interesting because Senga was a tier above Imanaga in MPB. But he was really at the top of his game when a lot of MLB scouts were watching him over the summer. His strikeout to walk ratio from June to July was especially insane, so I wouldn't be surprised if Imanaga ends up getting a huge contract like this. In terms of MLB comps for Imanaga, I'm thinking Wei Yan Chen or Andrew Heaney, but with the potential to be much, much better than those guys. Can he be an ace in MLB? Probably not, but can he be a solid middle rotation option? Absolutely. No idea where he's going to land, but the teams that were heavily scouting him back in June include the Rangers, Phillies, Cubs, Cardinals, Diamondbacks, Reds, Mets, Blue Jays, Padres, Giants, Yankees, and Red Sox. Imanaga has always been a top 10, sometimes even a top 5 pitcher in MPB in my eyes since 2019, so I can't wait to see how he does stateside. Next up is Rakuten Eagles left-hander Yuki Matsui. Now, Matsui is short, he's only 5'8", but don't let his build fool you, because much like Imanaga, Matsui is a nasty strikeout pitcher. He came up at 18 as a top prospect and has experience as a starter in the past, but he really hit his stride as a closer, and even became the youngest player in MPB history to reach the 200 save milestone at just 27 years old. 
Since the start of the 2020 season, Matsui has a 1.66 ERA across 152 frames with an elite 36.4% strikeout rate. He's only surrendered 8 homers in that span and has put up some of the best soft contact rates in the league as well. Now, Matsui only sits 91-93 to on his fastball, so people may be surprised to hear that he is a perennial top 3 closer in Japan. Much like Imanaga though, Matsui's fastball has superb induced vertical movement, and his secondaries get very good separation. The forkball is his primary swing and miss weapon, with batters whiffing almost a third of the time against it this past year, and hitting just 145 against it. But according to some of the advanced metrics, his slider is an even better pitch, as it was worth 2.4 runs above average, according to Delta Graphs. Matsui doesn't have significant platoon splits, but he does favor the forkball more against righties and the slider more against lefties, typically painting the corners low and away. Other than his height or lack thereof, some MLB teams might be turned off by the fact that he really struggled at the WBC using an MLB ball, never getting comfortable with it enough to earn a meaningful role in Japan's bullpen. His tempo on the mound is also super slow, so I'm a bit concerned about how he'll do with the pitch clock. But he was also on the 2015 Premier 12 team, the 2017 WBC team, and the 2018 MLB All-Star Series, so he does have plenty of international experience to learn from. In terms of MLB comps, it's really tough to say because there's not many pitchers as small as Mitsui, so I have to go with Billy Wagner. Obviously, I'm not saying Matsui is Wagner in MLB, but if you were to scale Matsui's game in MPB to the MLB level, you essentially have Billy Wagner. And there really just isn't a precedent for such a young Japanese reliever going to MLB. Everyone else like Kyuji Fujikawa or Yoshihisa Hirano were already in their 30s and on the decline. So with a deceptive fastball and two plus secondaries, I think Matsui can have success as a middle to high leverage late inning option in MLB. He's not just some sort of lefty specialist. And it's also important to note that Matsui is an international free agent, so he doesn't need to go through the posting system. MLB Trade Rumors estimates he'll get a two-year deal worth $16 million. There isn't much information about potential suitors right now, but the Cardinals are currently the team linked to him most. And I'd also say the Padres and Diamondbacks are potential destinations given their track record of going after MPB guys like Nick Martinez, Robert Suarez, Kazuhisa Makita, Yoshihisa Hirano, and Scott McGough. I really hope Matsui finds an environment that will give him ample time to adapt. Next up is Nippon Ham Fighters right-hander Naoyuki Uwasawa, and I'll keep this one short. He's entering his age 30 season and has had a successful MPB career as a finesse pitcher. His best asset is his incredibly deep arsenal, throwing seven pitches including a four-seam, two-seam, curveball, forkball, slider, cutter, and changeup. The fork is a plus pitch, but otherwise, none of his secondaries really stand out. He's just very good at mixing speeds with average to above average command, allowing him to limit hard contact and post slightly above league average strikeout rates across his nine-year career. And he dealt with quite a few injuries early on in his career, but has become a very durable innings eater since 2020. The problem is, Uwasawa's fastball is typically in the 88 to 90 mile per hour range, maybe 92 on a good day, so it's definitely not up to MLB standards. And you may be saying, that's okay, he can add a few miles in a pitching savvy organization. But I wouldn't count on it because he worked really hard at driveline in Washington this past offseason and didn't see significant gains. So he might have already reached his ceiling here. In fact, his average velo was actually lower in 2023 than in 2021 or 2022. And his ground ball rate was also at a career low of 40%. I wish I could hold Uasawa in higher regard, but the nicest comps I could possibly give him are going to be in the Chris Flexen, Kyle Gibson, Jordan Lyles range. His manager Tsuyoshi Shinjo told him not to accept a minor league deal, and it's really going to be an uphill battle for him if he gets a major league deal. MLB Trade Rumors doesn't have a contract prediction for him, but I think it'll be pretty close to what Kohei Arihara got from Texas a few years ago, two years, six million. I hope Uwasawa gets a shot as a depth piece in a small market somewhere and maybe he can prove us all wrong. 
Next up is former Trinity Dragons righty Yariel or Jariel Rodriguez, and not enough people are talking about this guy. He seems like an afterthought on most people's radars. The Dragons have a pipeline to acquire young talent from the Cuban National Series, and Rodriguez joined the team in 2020, putting up some nasty numbers on the farm, but not quite making it as a starter at the top MPB level. So Trinity decided to move Rodriguez to the bullpen full-time in 2022, and that's when he had a huge breakout, posting a 1.15 ERA and striking out 60 batters across 54 and two-thirds innings as a setup man for Rydal Martinez. Most impressive of all, he only gave up 32 hits and didn't allow a single homer all year. His average velo jumped from 93 miles per hour when he was a starter to 96 miles per hour as a reliever, occasionally running it up to triple digits. But Rodriguez's best tool is his slider, which is a world-class pitch by any definition, sitting in the low 80s, clocked at almost 3,000 RPMs during the WBC. In 2022, opposing batters batted just 082 against this slider, and it was worth 13.3 runs above average, according to Delta Graphs. That ranked second in MPB, only behind Taisuke Yamaoka, despite throwing 74 fewer innings than him. He also occasionally throws in a changeup and splitter, though that will depend on whether he gets an opportunity to be a starter in MLB, and that's really the question here. Does Rodriguez have what it takes to make it as a starter as he showed during the WBC? He was pretty much league average as a starter in Japan, and he was hampered by his slightly erratic command and shallow arsenal. As a reliever, he could unleash everything he's got in short bursts, and could afford to be a two-pitch guy, especially because he throws gas and that slider is so unhittable. But you may have noticed I haven't said anything about Rodriguez's 2023 season yet, and that's because he didn't pitch. After Cuba made it to the WBC semifinals in Miami, he decided to defect from his country to pursue an MLB deal, but was barred from doing so because he had already signed a two-year contract with the Dragons and was thus placed on the restricted list. I actually got to see him pitch in person for the Cuba vs. Australia quarterfinals in March, and little did I know this would be the last time Rodriguez pitches on Japanese soil. He was granted MLB free agency after the 2023 season, so he's able to sign anywhere now, but abandoning his commitment to the Dragons a day before the season started was definitely not a good look, and it means we don't know what kind of form he's in right now. But he has been pitching in some showcases in the Dominican Republic over the past few months, and by all accounts, his stuff looks great. MLB Trade Rumors predicts the 26-year-old is getting a four-year deal worth $32 million, and Francis Romero reports that the Yankees, Astros, Rangers, Pirates, Dodgers, Phillies, Blue Jays, White Sox, Mets, and Giants are the 10 strongest candidates to sign him. If he's a reliever, I would expect him to put up similar numbers to a Sir Anthony Dominguez or a Robert Suarez, who was also a mediocre starter in Japan before turning into an elite reliever and going to San Diego. But if he's more of a starter or a swingman, I see him as having the potential of a guy like Christian Javier. An explosive but limited repertoire may be good for two times through the order. For more on Rodriguez, I recommend checking out Phil from Cuba Dugout, and the last thing I'll say about him is that he is a Cuban pitcher at heart, but his mechanics and mindset have really been honed in a Japanese style. He even throws from two different arm slots sometimes to mess with hitters, so I'm eager to see how well he does in MLB. And last but not least, the biggest prize of them all, Yoshinobu Yamamoto of the Oryx Buffaloes. Yamamoto was only a fourth round pick back in 2016, so he was not a highly regarded prospect in the beginning, but after debuting at 18 years old and showing promise as a reliever, he quickly established himself in the starting rotation and has done nothing but pure domination, compiling a resume that stands up against any pitcher in the history of modern Japanese baseball. Overall, he posted a 70-29 record with a 1.82 ERA, 2.37 FIP, and an 0.94 whip, tallying 922 strikeouts and just 206 walks over 897 innings. Among pitchers with at least 895 innings since the formation of MPB in 1950, only two others have maintained a career ERA below two, Kazuhisa Inao at 1.98 and Yu Darvish at 1.99. 
It's worth noting that MPB is in a dead ball era right now. The balls don't have much carry, and they're slightly smaller and tackier than the MLB balls, making it easier for pitchers to manipulate. But Inal and Darvish similarly benefited from a low-scoring environment throughout most of their careers. So needless to say, Yamamoto's run prevention is truly historic. In 2023, Yamamoto secured his third straight Sawamura Award, the Japanese equivalent of the Cy Young, and he's expected to win his third straight Pacific League MVP as well. Over the 72-year history of MPB, Hisashi Yamada is the only other pitcher to have won three straight MVPs, and Masaichi Kaneda is the sole player to have received three consecutive Sawamuras. But no pitcher has ever captured three straight pitching triple crowns, and that's exactly what Yamamoto accomplished this year with 16 wins, a 1.21 ERA, and 169 strikeouts. So achieving a three-peat of any of these in isolation would be historic, but the fact that he did all three in tandem puts him in a league of his own and solidifies his claim as not only the greatest pitcher in the modern era, but possibly of all time, at least in terms of peak performance. Everyone knows it's very difficult to be at the absolute top of your game every time out, and even the best pitchers in the world have a handful of bad starts in any given year. But what really sets Yamamoto apart is the consistency in his utter dominance. Quality start percentage is not a perfect metric, but it gives you an idea of how often a guy is giving his team a fighting chance to win, and Yamamoto has an incredible quality start percentage of 85% since 2019. In 8 of his last 9 starts in the 2023 regular season, he allowed 0 earned runs, including a stretch of 45 straight scoreless innings from August 1st to September 16th. And if you go all the way back to May 30th, Yamamoto posted a sub-1 ERA over his final 16 starts. On September 9th, he also became just the 10th pitcher in MPB history to throw multiple no-hitters in a career, and the first to throw a no-no in back-to-back -back seasons. To add to the historic milestone, he did so in front of dozens of MLB scouts and executives, most notably New York Yankees GM Brian Cashman. So what's the secret formula behind Yamamoto's success? Well, his stuff isn't nearly as explosive as the young phenom Roki Sasaki, but his arsenal is far deeper and more polished. He sports a four-seam fastball, two-seam fastball, forkball, curveball, cutter, and a slider slash sweeper. The two-seam cutter and sweeper are pitches he almost exclusively uses against righties, rarely throwing it against lefties at all. When he first broke into the league, many opposing hitters considered the cutter to be his best pitch, but he gradually phased it out as that pitch became less effective, and now his primary weapons are the fastball, forkball, and curveball, all of which rate as world-class weapons. He threw the fastball around 45% of the time this year, and it consistently clocks in at around 95 miles per hour, occasionally reaching 99 miles per hour, with opponents batting just 176 against it with one home run. Aram Layton of JustBaseball.com had great analysis on the pitch, quote, Yamamoto's average four-seam release height is around 5.4 to 5.5 feet. For context, around 80% of MLB four-seam fastballs are released from a higher spot, the low release point paired with the more than 17 inches of induced vertical break on the pitch help him rack up a lot of whiffs in the zone. Equally remarkable is his forkball, the most popular put-away pitch among many elite Japanese arms, holding a batting average against of a mere 164, coupled with a superb 24% whiff rate. For comparison, Kodai Senga's famous ghost fork had a 30% whiff rate in 2022, so Yamamoto's is almost on that same level. But let's not forget he also has a great 12-6 curveball with a 194 opponent batting average, and even the sweeper which he barely throws has a 211 opponent average. Altogether, opposing hitters slashed 198, 241, 240 against him this year for an OPS of 481. Now, Yamamoto has struggled at times in the postseason as he suffered the worst start of his career in Game 1 of the Japan series with seven earned runs, opening the door for criticism of him not being a big game pitcher. But this is really an overblown narrative. He was outstanding back in the 2021 playoffs, and in his very last start as a Buffalo this year, he absolutely shoved with a 138 pitch complete game, setting a new Japan series record with 14 strikeouts. Now, a pitch count like that is obviously a bit concerning when it comes to his health, especially when you consider that he threw 100-plus pitches in over three-quarters of his career outings, including the postseason, 
but he hasn't had any major injuries yet. Fingers crossed. And his career inning total is significantly less than what guys like Daisuke Matsuzaka, Yu Darvish, and Masahiro Tanaka had before going to MLB. And while most pitchers get worse as the game goes on, Yamamoto was actually at his best the third time through the order this season with a 28.6% strikeout rate, speaking to his stamina, deep arsenal, cerebral sequencing, and ability to locate the ball where he wants at any moment. The last thing I'll mention here is that Yamamoto had a fairly traditional Japanese delivery in the past, featuring a mid-leg kick pause as a timing mechanism, but during this past winter, he completely overhauled his mechanics, eliminating the pause completely and even shortening his stride. So he has a very clean, fluid delivery, though some may argue it's putting more stress on his arm. And it helped him become far better at preventing the running game this year, with the number of stolen bases against him dropping from 16 in 2022 to a mere 5 in 2023, which will prove even more valuable with MLB's new rules like the pickoff limit and pitch clock, which really shouldn't bother him because he only averaged 15 seconds between pitches anyway, and he did just fine with the MLB ball at the WBC. So with all that being said, what kind of contract will Yamamoto command when he's posted? Well, MLB Trade Rumors has him at 9 years, $225 million, which already takes most of the small and mid-market teams out of the running, but I would not be shocked at all if he gets close to $250 million, which really is more like $300 million when you include the posting fee going to the Oryx Buffaloes. He's only 25 years old, and how often does a superstar ace like him hit the market at such a young age in MLB? The answer would be never. He is the Japanese Pedro Martinez, so it's bittersweet for me to see him go because I've absolutely loved watching him do his thing every week for the past five years, but he deserves to get paid, and I expect him to be nothing less than a Rookie of the Year and Cy Young finalist in 2024. So there you have it, my player profiles on Shota Imanaga, Yuki Matsui, Naoyuki Uesawa, Yario Rodriguez, and Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Which pitcher do you realistically want your favorite team to sign? Leave it in the comments below. Thanks for watching, make sure to follow me on X at Yaku Cosmo. Please like and subscribe for more MPB content in English.